Hello and thanks for joining. Welcome to Frontline, where we like to discuss all things military, medical, and otherwise interesting. The medical personnel of the First and Second World War were incredible individuals in their own right. Trained to defend themselves and save lives on the battlefield, they fought in equal measure against the enemy, as well as fighting valiantly to save their brothers and sisters in arms. He's gone. I'm sure the desire and technique of how to keep your men alive and in the fight has always been evolving as long as there's been organized warfare. If we are to look at specific conflicts in history, we can glean some insight to how we develop the efficient and educated modern medical services we have today. The terrible loss of life from the Great War would ensure extended thought and care of the wounded would be a top priority at the onset of the next World War. Often, this would be done with little more than what you would find in a simple first aid kit today. With scissors, bandages, and gauze, they went forward to staunch the flow of blood from horrible wounds and loss of limb, often while still under fire. Regardless of their specific military branch, medics, corpsmen, or aid men kept their casualties alive long enough to receive a higher level of treatment further along the lines. In doing this often heroic work, the aid men of World War II, along with some new innovations, drastically reduced the expected casualty rate from the Great War. This would continue to bring us leaps and bounds closer to the amazing survival rate we have today. The career of a medic began like any other soldier might. After some simple tests and a physical, the new recruit would report to boot camp where they would begin basic training. Here, they would learn how to become a soldier first, learning about their own military and traditions, how to drill and present themselves with dress and deportment. Regardless of their preferred specialization, all troops were required to earn their soldier qualification by learning first how to wage war with rifle, bayonet, and grenade. You were a soldier first and a medic second after all. This training period would vary depending on your country of origin and at what stage in the war you were enlisting. At the onset, U.S. conscripts could expect a nine-week training course before heading to further training in their chosen speciality. Medics were sometimes chosen for presenting an aptitude for medical expertise. However, at times, conscientious objectors who opposed taking life would be assigned this role as an alternative to a combat unit. Regardless of the reason they became a medic, in total, 11 service members would be awarded the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor by the end of the war. Now back to our recruit. After completing basic soldier qualification, it was time to become a battlefield medic. This included several weeks of anatomy and physiology classes, as well as emergency pre-hospital training, which included lifelike scenarios that resemble many injury patterns we still train for today. This education would accumulate with the most recent innovations to the military repertoire, such as the introduction of blood and plasma infusions, improved splinting techniques, as well as vast improvements to the chain of evacuation off the battlefield. Newer and exciting treatments were making waves as well. Medications such as sulfa drugs and analgesics like morphine would become a welcome addition to the medic's aid bag. War, for all its harm and destruction, is a catalyst for innovation. Much older, tried and tested equipment like the tourniquet would again make an appearance, and again, there were initial issues with misuse and even overuse, as history would continue to repeat, even to the modern day. After completion of this specialized training, the medic would be assigned to a unit for either deployment or other duty. However, depending on the individual, the career path of the newly qualified medic would not end here. Further career progression was available. These came in the form of administrative courses, but also technician positions, which were a way to further specialize into a specific skill set and area of medicine. The positions available could include x-ray and pharmacy technician, orthopedic and laboratory tech, and even veterinarian positions. Initially, interest for such training was low, and generally only appealed to the career soldier who was expected to continue re-enlistment. However, as the war began and more allied countries ramped up their war effort, interest and demand greatly outpaced any ability to train new recruits fast enough. During the early years of the war, it was the Commonwealth countries, notably Canada, the United Kingdom and Australia, that would set the standard for the battlefield. In the regimental aid post, you might find surgeons, nurses, and technicians working side by side, administering medications, performing open surgery, and providing blood products to the wounded. It was the role of the aid men to provide the supply of wounded to these field hospitals. 
they would begin by providing emergent care to the soldier on the front line. This might include packing wounds, staunching arterial bleeding, and providing relief from pain where they could. Just like in the Great War, here again bullets, shrapnel, and shells were the primary cause of wounds in the theaters of war. While carrying out these treatments, every medic under the Geneva Convention was expected to identify themselves as medical personnel. In reality, the situation could be very different. Reports of enemy personnel specifically targeting medics was not uncommon, and reportedly occurred on both sides. Japan, initially not being a signatory to the Geneva Convention, was of particular note. While fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, U.S. Marines, among other Allied soldiers, reported that the Japanese troops would wound and aim in the hopes of drawing out any nearby aid men to shoot in turn. These reports often led to aid men removing their red crosses from their uniform in an attempt to blend in with the soldiers around them. Once a casualty was identified and initial treatment given, the chain of evacuation would begin. Often, this occurred during active fighting, and if no troops could be spared, it was the job of the combat medics, two of which generally were assigned to each U.S. company. Once treatment was provided on the field, it was the job of these medics to arrange transportation back behind the lines for further care. Unlike in the First World War, great strides had been made beyond the horse and buggy. Motor vehicle and automobiles would be used in greater numbers to provide a seamless chain of evacuation to place the wounded in front of a nurse or surgeon. For the first time in a major war, air evacuation would be widely implemented by most major armies, notably by the Germans to escape the Eastern Front after their failed attempt to invade Russia. This is a good time to give a shout out to the aid women of the war as Russia did not discriminate as heavily toward the fairer sex. As a recently wounded Russian soldier, you were likely to have a female combat medic respond to your calls for aid. These medics would often be embedded in combat units and fought Nazis in the trenches alongside their male comrades. Regardless of the army in question, medical units further behind the edge of battle likely included female nurses and care aides, despite the ever-present danger from long-range artillery and indiscriminate air raids. German medics called sanitata were known to give some of the highest level of care as well, often working increasingly close with nurses and doctors as the war moved further into their borders. Already well known for having some of the most sanitary field conditions from the Great War, German medics would go on to become some of the most seasoned troops in combat. That is, if they survived through to the next theater of war they found themselves in. Major factors like the training, innovations, and technological improvements we've discussed would eventually result in the survival rate for the wounded and ill to drastically increase to 50% during the course of the war. This astonishing figure towered over the 4% survival rate we had from World War I. Battlefield medical advances would continue after the war ended, and again being driven by leaps and bounds from future conflicts in Vietnam, Korea, and others. By 2016, a service member wounded in Iraq or Afghanistan had an overall 92% chance of survival. In fact, in the Kandahar Multinational Hospital, survival sat at 98% if you arrived with a heartbeat. This amazing feat only possible through the amazing work of the combat medic.